And we're live. Hi, everyone. I'm Simone Davis from the Montessori Notebook here in Amsterdam. And I'm Jeanne-Marie Penel uh, speaking to you from San Diego from Voila Montessori. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. It's super exciting to be running the Montessori show again. It's going to be on the last Friday of every month. So that we hope you're able to join us. Today, we've decided to talk about how to set up our spaces at home. So uh, I love this topic. I think Jean-Marie does as well. It's one that we get asked about all the time. So we know that it's important to you as well. And uh, we hope that you'll be sending in lots of questions uh, about your homes as well. Uh, we have had some questions sent in, which is a great start. But how are things yes. over there, Jean-Marie? Oh, great, great. Um, I just want to make sure that I'm going to see everybody's questions. So if you can type in the comments under the video, then I can uh, read them and ask Simone since she's uh, going to be sharing all her expertise about setting up uh, your home Montessori style. So I do have uh, some questions for you, Simone, if you want to start or do you want to kind of give us a brief overview of what it is, what does that mean, setting up your home Montessori style? <laughs> Yeah, so I guess it's like starting from scratch. I guess most people often find themselves with a new baby and inundated with lots of toys and they end up on the floor everywhere and our living rooms are taken over. And then we might start getting interested in the Montessori approach and we look around and think, actually, how can I set up this space so it's more ideal so that my child actually engaged with these activities so there's less clutter. And uh, that's how I kind of see setting up spaces Montessori style. Mm -hmm. And you? Mm -hmm. um, about the same. I mean, it's about really simplifying, but I think also more importantly, it's really about looking at the environment from the child's perspective and really uh, making sure that we are uh, looking at the environment from their perspective because we've been in a very adult-centered environment and suddenly these little humans have very different needs and it's it's like having this uh, guest that has special needs in our home and how we when we have a special guest come we kind of change around the the environment we you know put clean sheets on the bed and we get a bouquet of flowers and, and so forth. Well, for this child, it's just going to be a long term because they're going to be staying with us for a while. But it's really about what are the needs of the child from the time of birth through, um, you know, through six years uh, until they actually leave the home. I have teenagers at home and, you know, the environment is different for them. So it's it's really about looking at the environment from the child's perspective. Yeah, definitely always updating, observing your child and making changes as they grow. They tend mm -hmm. to be one step ahead of us always, even as much as we prepare ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. So um, if you want, I can go right into some of the questions that we've received. Sure. So uh, the Marina from uh, Russia um, wrote to us about having an 11 month old boy who is very active and she uh, mentions that she set up her environment, um, you know, with the Montessori style with some toys and such, but he is always on the move and he um, is just taking things and kind of, you know, putting pieces of the puzzle as he walks by and things like that. And so she's asking, um, is this normal for his age? And um, is this how can I prepare the environment for a very active, curious uh, boy who is constantly on the move? Well, it definitely sounds very normal. <laughs> mm -hmm. Eleven month old boys uh, are very active and eleven month old girls can be active. It doesn't have to be the gender at all. Mm -hmm. uh, but I definitely think that uh, if they are active, then you're going to have, I think, is the baby crawling or walking already? Walking. Walking. Yeah. So, I mean, for a baby who was still crawling, for example, you could have things that encourage them to start walking by having ottomans and low tables and pull up bars and practicing cruising, low shelves and things. But if they're already crawling and walking, then I would actually even have small furniture that, for them to move around um, because they love picking up heavy objects once they've already mastered walking. Um, I would set up obstacle courses for them so that they can climb over and under and through, um, set up cubby houses for them to explore and things like that so they're constantly on the move and challenging themselves. 
get out to the park and move their bodies a lot. If you have a back garden, then you can also have climbing opportunities and things like that outside and hanging and swinging and all of the gross motor movements is very, very important to work mm -hmm. on. Um, about just doing a piece of puzzle here and there, that is exactly how an 11 month old explores their environment. They won't, it's a one step activity basically. They don't have mm -hmm. the concentration yet to sit there to do a five piece puzzle. But all of that exploration, you'll see them basically absorbing, taking in all their environment. And as they get older, you'll see all of that information going back in as they, oh, all of a sudden place that puzzle piece back into the uh, puzzle that they've had on the shelf available to them. So you'll see that they're working in different ways. Um, having puzzle pieces with different size knobs as well. You can see what are they practicing? Are they practicing their pincer grips? Uh, why is he touching it like that? Does he like the materials that are involved? Like we like wooden materials in a Montessori environment. So right. I'd be really observing him and seeing what is it that he's getting out of this activity and how can I provide more of it? That's often what we often think of as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I know that, uh, you know, in, in my training, I remember being told that the, the toddler in, in the toddler environment is going to be working standing at the shelf. It's not like the two and a half, three year old who's actually going to take material and take it to the table. So it is part of that uh, environment as well is that they're like, you know, uh, like Marina has witnessed, they're constantly on the move. So, yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. And then... Um People can definitely also um, add questions on the YouTube page where they're viewing. They're not coming up today like they did last time. So if you're there, welcome everybody. I see lots of viewers online. So uh, thanks for all joining us tonight. Yes, I don't know where the questions um, questions aren't coming up just yet. So I we do have some questions that were sent in ahead of time. So we'll just continue going through those. Um, so there is, of course, there's the question, and I think this comes up for a lot of people, is what what are some appropriate um, activities? So Simone, I would love you to share some of your favorite that you have in your environment. And I would also encourage um, viewers, there is on my website, I have under my free resources, I have a timeline from birth to three that, that is somewhat helpful. It's a timeline that we use in our training. And it's just little illustrations of some of the activities that we can offer our children uh, kind of in a sequential way. And that's um, always helpful. And that's, uh, like I said, under the free resources. And I'll put the link um, under the video. OK, perfect. And which age did you uh, say that the activities so were for? This was, this was particularly for 12 to 15 month old. Okay. Um, Great. Well, that would kind of fall right between my two classes. That they could be at the younger end of uh, the toddler class or the higher age of the babies. And at this age, you see a lot of posting activities going on. They love getting a ball and putting it through a hole and seeing it come out again. So they're practicing object impermanence. So when you leave the room and you come back, they, f they don't realize yet that you're leaving and coming back. So they're practicing that. Same with the ball object going through. And once they mastered that simple one, you could go to um, an activity with a hammer. So you could hammer the ball and it, make it go through and come out. And then there's another one with a little drawer and you can open the drawer and it comes out. They're also busy with threading activities. So you might remember those nice, um, oh, it's difficult to explain actually. It has rings that go on top of a stacker. And they like, if with a young baby of 12 months, I might just have a bangle or something large that they can easily put over the top and then get the hole going smaller and smaller as they go along. So you can see oh, what are they finding easy or more difficult um, and, you don't have to have all of the five pieces that come with the set set out. You can say, oh, okay, at the moment they're working and I'm finding that they're just taking them off and throwing them everywhere. So maybe just start right. with one or two pieces and then you can keep modifying your environment as they develop as well. Uh, other things that are great for 12 to 15 months old, a basket of balls um, because that encourages their movement and they love rolling balls backwards and forwards to you. They like chasing after the ball, they can practice catching. You can get them to put their arms out in front of them like this and they push it up to their chest even. Um, so there's lots of those kind of gross motor skills that we were talking about earlier, as well as a wagon is always really nice, particularly if they're still mastering walking, they can mm -hmm. get support. What's really nice, the Montessori approach is rather than holding the fingers of the child so that they can walk, is actually to 
wait until the baby is pulling themselves up onto something that moves. You'll see them at that stage because they'll pu push a chair around and you'll know, okay, now they're ready for the wagon. Right. So, yeah, and th then they build, they're getting into the position themselves and their mm -hmm. muscles are ready for it. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's really important too. Um, what other activities do we have at that age? There's lots of uh, exploration going on. With the, they're still putting a lot in their mouth. So again, it has to be quite large. Um, mm -hmm. and if it's going in the mouth, you'd like it to be natural materials as well. <laughs> so there's right. not always plastic in their mouth and, and things like that. So uh, there's some of our favorites in our baby class and at the other end. When they get a little bit older, our coin box, so the posting becomes more subtle and more refined. And so they can start to post a, a coin or a disc into a smaller slot mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. and things like that, which is really nice as well. And you have those nesting boxes, which are almost like first puzzles as well, where you have maybe a cone that fits into a bigger cone or a cube that fits into a bigger cube. And they're practicing these, um, yeah, fitting things together, taking them apart. These are all different ways of working at eye-hand coordination and the fine motor skills. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, and you you just mentioned putting everything in their in their mouth, and actually, this is the next question: is this notion of when do you invite children to do activities around food and in the kitchen? <laughs> yeah, we love having our little yeah. babies and toddlers helping us in the kitchen. Yes. So I really introduce them as young as possible because when they're babies, they might be able to just watch and observe what we're doing and they're always reaching out and touching. And so when they see us put food in our mouth and they start opening their mouth too, you know that they're ready to have the sensorial experience. Um, they want to touch and all the food and those kind of things. It's easiest once they're standing because you can have them standing on a step ladder or uh, yeah, by you with a step stool. Um, there's also lean learning towers and things like that where you can put the child inside and they're enclosed or a DIY kind of version as well. Um, so there's no specific age. I've got photos of my nine month old stirring with some baking. Mm -hmm. I know she's sitting mm -hmm. on the floor. Mm -hmm. We moved a small table into the kitchen and she was helping us bake cookies. And um, so, they're getting different things out of it at different ages. Even this week in class, we were making hot cross buns for fun for Easter. I don't know if you have them in America. I don't think you do. It's no. like a it's like a fruit bread, and mm -hmm. it has a little cross on the top in the Easter style. Mm -hmm. And um, so I did them with the toddlers and the preschoolers, and the preschoolers obviously were all sitting and getting involved. Some of the toddlers would stay for a couple of minutes and then wander off and lose interest and then come back and need a little bit and walk away again. And that's so fall again following their interest. And with the babies, I sat on the side and there was one baby who came up and rubbed his hands in the flour and put it in his mouth and he's experiencing it that way. But they could all smell the cinnamon and the spices that were going in and watching the process. And so I love to get them involved at every age. So at every different level, they're doing different contribution. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, um, and I would love if you would talk a little bit about kind of the, the, the basics of how to set up the kitchen at home for, you know, to, to encourage the child. I know, and for me, I mean, when, when parents ask me about, you know, when to involve the child in the kitchen, well, they, they show signs very early on that they want to be in the kitchen with you and they want to be able to participate. So I really, really encourage, um, all parents to when children are wanting to be there to invite them in give them a little piece of what you're doing you know don't expect great results um, but it's just about involving them and welcoming them welcoming them in as opposed to saying oh no 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 this is you know this is mommy's work you go play well that is play for them that is what they want to be doing they want to be there with you experiencing and and feeling like they're important they're preparing the meal with you so you know as simone said as as early as they show interest welcome them into the kitchen and and help them uh feel you know confident about helping yeah, and I love like seeing, thinking, okay, how can I simplify this to their level? And so for a one-year-old, it might just be washing some lettuce in the sink or shredding the lettuce leaves then into pieces or maybe taking some grapes off the stalk, these kind of things, very simple one-step activities. And then you can make more complicated um, or help. they can help you with peeling. I have beautiful photos that a mum sent me of a two-year-old peeling 
some potatoes and they were really done perfectly. So once you show them, don't ex just give them a peeler, but really first show them how it can be that you, instead of holding it in the air, you'll need to rest it onto the table and then you can do it in simple strokes one by one, not trying to make very long, you know, pieces exactly. of peel or anything like exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah, and that is all activities that that are just wonderful for concentration, wonderful for uh, just, you know, like I say, having this sense of belonging to the community, the, the family community. So so definitely encouraged to, um, to have them in the kitchen. Do you want to touch a little bit about maybe how to think uh, about setting up the kitchen for maybe a walking age child? Yeah, definitely. So uh, like in our classroom, I would do the same at home. I try and make accessible the bowls and the glasses and things that the child's going to set the table with. So they might have some cutlery as well. You don't have to have a whole pile because they will get in that drawer and play with it until they're used to, oh, I can go and access it myself and I can set the table for my snack and I'm hungry. I know some people even have little boxes in that drawer as well, which has got their snacks for the day so they can help themselves to a snack and take it to the table and it's only got as much snack in as the child as the parent wants so maybe the first time you put it out they might eat it all the first time they see it and then they realize oh actually it's going to be there all day so they'll learn to do it other times um so having everything low down everyone always laughs when they come to my house because they go to take a glass out of the cupboard and there's nothing up there it's all the pots and pans and things because everything in our house even though my kids are a bigger is still down low because it's just much more accessible. You don't have to have kids asking you to get things out for them. I also love having uh, a, a little tiny pitcher or jug um, with a little bit of water in it so they can help themselves to pour water at any time. Some homes might have more space and could actually have a whole water um, jug with a tap that they can actually help themselves with again. Mm -hmm. And again, the first time you put that out, they're going to think, this is a new toy. I'm going to see how this works. And you'll have the child running water and water. But trust the process. And that once that experience is over, they will learn to not just play with it, but actually use it for drinking water right. as well. Right. So yeah. those kind of things are lovely. And uh, yeah, it's really fun to get them involved. At, um, meal time, setting the table, having um, things set up for breakfast, for example, with a cloth already at the ready because you know there's going to be a spill, a little pot of, um, a little jug of milk on the table so they can pour their own glass of milk or add it to their cereal, whatever they're doing. So I love looking at all the steps of your, you know, process and seeing how they can be involved and thinking, mm -hmm. okay, maybe if we just have a small amount of cereal and put it into a little jar, then they can scoop out that. And if they tipped it all on the table, there wouldn't be so much to clean up. Yeah, exactly, definitely. exactly. And I remember from a personal experience, I remember my son wanting to put his milk in his cereal. Um, and we here in the States, we have these big gallon jugs. I mean, they're, they're, they're heavy and they're cumbersome. And, you know, it was it was a struggle. And sometimes there was a spill. And just, you know, I remember thinking like, well, why don't I just put the amount of milk that he needs in a little pitcher? And that just was, that was it. That's all he needed was that little extra step to be able to be independent and, and feel, you know, confident to, to do it himself. So, so just thinking, you know, like you say, of, of giving them just small steps, um, very, very important. Um, I do have another question, and this is not related to food or the kitchen. It's, it's going into the bedroom and uh, the child getting dressed. And uh, I have a, a, a mom that I've been working with who has a 15-month-old um, child who is blind. And we have, we have set up the environment uh, for her to be very independent. And she has made immense progress and really able to figure out her environment very well. But she's showing interest about her clothes and wanting to put them on and off. What would you... Um, what would be your um, kind of suggestions to set that up for her uh, to be a little bit more independent about getting dressed? Okay. And with the blind child, are they able to see a little bit of their environment with yeah. blindness? You have, it's completely dark. 
Yeah, this is really interesting. I've not worked with any blind children before. But let's say that they have limited skills. It would be very important that everything's in the same place all the time. And this exactly. is the same even for a child who can see because toddlers have a very strong sense of order. So it's nice if they're always their shoes are in the same spot and their basket that they can choose from is always in the same spot and things like that. Normally, I'd offer a choice of clothing. Would you like the blue one or the red one? But maybe that's a bit more difficult with the with someone who's blind. So I would um, help them. I would talk to them as I was preparing, maybe the night before. So we're going to choose some clothes for tomorrow, and I'm going to put a t-shirt in the basket, and I'm going to put some trousers in the basket, and then you can help yourself. You know, when you wake up, and then. How do they get themselves around the house? Sorry, Jean Marie, I'm not really sure. They're they're just like a regular child. She's just adapted her life to you know she she has a sense that is not um, there, but she's she's very independent in walking around and and uh, we've set up the environment with uh, her toys on low shelves and she's able to get out of her bed and, and um, is just you know very independent little girl. Um, but she should. So, um, so yeah, so I mean, for me, it was, uh, you know, uh, I didn't know if you had something specific, but to me, it's really like you say, it's just keeping the things in the same place and, and maybe having uh, a very limited choice, because it's true with a child who is who does have a visual sense, we might put, you know, two or three outfits and, and, and give them the choice of what they'd like to wear. Uh, there, it might be just, um, maybe talking you know to them of, of how they'd like to feel and just put out that one outfit out in a specific place that they always know that they can go and get and and definitely having a little chair near to where they get dressed this is very helpful to be able to put on um underwear and pants and socks if you if you're you know sitting um and and so forth so uh, to me, it, it wouldn't really be any different other than maybe not as many choices. Yeah, I think it's super um, exciting, actually. And the more I think about it, the more I think I would use a lot of practice as well, is like not just getting dressed because you need to get dressed, but at neutral times, this is how we take our socks off. This is how we put our exactly. socks on. This yeah. is the opening of a shirt. This is how your shirt goes over your head. This is how your arm goes in. It's like with a uh, child who can see, but also just practicing even more um, so that they actually can take those skills on, learn them, um, and become more and more independent would be really exciting. Right. And, and having maybe, uh, you know, textures, like uh, if you feel the tag, you know, we, we, always again we use our visual sense to see where the tag is there it's about feeling where the tag is and how to orient the the shirt to to put it on and such so so great yes. and um, yeah. i've seen a couple of questions coming hello to sandra sandra rooney you'll have to help us pronounce your name but she's joining us again from germany and pata rawadi are you able to see the question jean marie i am not <laughs> so we have one on our YouTube channel. You might need to refresh your page. And um, there's also a Q&A coming through on the Google Hangout as well. But I can read them out for you if you like. Oh, um, there we go. Yes, I see them now. OK. Wonderful. Hello, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> we weren't ignoring you, just so we didn't refresh our, our, our browsers. <laughs> so um, there's actually a question from Pat Patara. Wadi. Everyone's got difficult names today. I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong. Um, Marie, when you said the toddler may work on the shelf, what would you do? Just let them work at the work at the shelf, I think they mean, or redirect them to bring it to the table? Do you remember you were talking about that earlier? Yes, so I, w I wouldn't redirect. I mean, I think we, we, we can remind them that it's, you know, you can, you have the option to take it to the table. But again, if the child is concentrated and working well, at the shelf, I don't really want to interrupt them. Um, so, you know, oftentimes uh, you will see them work at the shelf or sit on the floor right in front of the shelf and, and, and do work. And for me, that's okay. I don't know how you are in your environment, but that's kind of part of their process. And eventually they will take the work and bring it to a floor mat or to a table, but I don't, I personally don't redirect just because they're involved and they're they're concentrated. So 
Yeah, usually if you step in at that moment that they've already started concentrating, they immediately lose interest and they get exactly. distracted and walk away exactly. as opposed to actually encouraging them. So it's I best model exactly as you say, oh, we can take this to the table when they're not engaged in it yet. Um, and then they gradually learn um, that, yeah, you sit at the table to use that. I mean, it's just another step. I see a lot of the young children working at the shelves and then the older children bringing the work to the tables. The tables are lovely to work at because it does mark the area where they're working and helps their concentration as well. So yeah, it's a good process to practice as well. When to step in, when not, that's a real juggle for parents and teachers. Like I've been working in Montessori for over 10 years and I still, yeah, you always get it wrong sometimes. <laughs> that's okay too. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry yeah. that I interrupted your work. <laughs> yeah. And I, yeah, I love totally. uh, Sandra, Sandra Renu's question as well. She asks, um, she'd love to know our take on the main shifts that take place when setting up the home Montessori way when a child passes the age group zero to three and into the three to six years. And I do see big changes because the children are moving from a different stage of development. They're still in the same plane of development, which um, to quickly tell people about, um, Dr. Montessori talked about planes of development from zero to six, six to 12, 12 to 18 and 18 to 24. And you see parallels with these groups of children where they are in their development. So zero to six is the period of the absorbent mind where they're like sponges picking up everything in their space. And from zero to three, you have the unconscious absorbent mind where they're not even consciously taking it in. And then in the three to six period, it becomes a conscious absorbent mind. It's a super quick explanation of this very complicated process. But um, if they're consciously starting to crystallize everything that they learned in that first half of the plane. So when what I see anyway when they go from zero to three to three to six is that they remember that there's other activities that aren't out on the shelves and they have an idea maybe of what they'd like to do before they walk into the space. With a toddler from zero to three, you find they more like to work with what they see out on the shelf um, where I find that a three to six year old might say, oh, mommy, you remember that puzzle that we were working on and it's not out anymore and those kind of things. So what I would do is I would say, oh, we can get that puzzle out, but let's switch it for another one so that you're not constantly getting out more and more things. And then they mm -hmm. also realize, oh, something's going to go away. So I find that usually they know that the toys are going to be changed regularly and we can meet their needs. Um, I also find that the three to six-year-olds like to be involved in often changing the toys. I am a big believer in storing and rotating a lot of things because there's just, yeah, you really, to focus on things, you need less activities out to start with. And then... I would, when my kids were small, it was about once a week that I would change some things out to keep it interesting. But the things that they were still really concentrating on, I'd leave in the environment. So there are mm -hmm. a couple of the big shifts that I see when you set up the spaces for older children and that the activities become more complicated as well. So with the zero to three year olds, you're starting to build up to more steps in the activities. By three to six, I add in as many steps as I can. Like, oh, maybe actually, instead of having a tray set up with all of the art materials ready, they'll have to go and fetch a pencil from the place where the pencils always are. They'll have to get a piece of paper from the place where the paper, and so you're building steps into those processes as well. Right, right. And I know one of the big uh, difference that I noticed was how, how when the, the toddler, like you say, everything is in the tray and they, they basically work in the tray and, and, and do everything. And then with the three to six year old, it's really taking part of the process is laying out a mat, taking everything off of the tray, placing it in an orderly fashion. And there's just a lot more sequences and more steps to, um, to the activity. Take, for example, flower arrangement. Uh, for the toddler, we are going to pre-cut flowers and we are going to simply have them uh, pour water in a little vase, uh, pick a cut flower and put it in the vase and that's it. For the, the older child, it's going to be about choosing a flower and cutting it and, and visually comparing the, the size of the flower with the vase and so that's an extra step and that's a step that they have to make a choice as to how tall they want that flower to to be in the vase and they use a funnel and, and so forth so all of the activities that the toddler has already done we're just adding uh steps that are a little bit more about uh, precision and and as they develop their um you know uh fine motor skills and eye hand coordination and such 
Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so what else do we have? Um, so we do have some more questions. Um, this isn't as much about um, the environment as it is about language. And I know, I think we, we uh, talked about it this last time, but uh, I think with a, in our modern world, we're gonna have this question quite a bit, and that is a dual language family. And this is a family that uh, speaks uh, Russian and English. And so this is uh, true for anybody. And mom is asking how to encourage both languages being learned and what is the best way to do that. If she wants uh, her child, her, her uh, language is Russian, but she would like her child to speak English. So what would be the best approach for her to help her child acquire the English language? Oh, that's a really interesting question. And uh, while one person, one language is the most common way to introduce a child to different languages, if there's only Russian in a home environment, it's going to be looking at other ways for her to get the English. Um, so children actually are also very good at um, understanding routines and rituals. So there's a bilingual expert who comes and does a workshop at our space and she says you could even make a meal time that's always English speaking. You can, um, when you need a babysitter, have an English speaker. You could go to a play group that's English speaking. And if you want them to become, if it's a, your goal is that it's a literacy language, that is that they're going to study in that language or maybe attend school or university, that they spend 30% of their week speaking that language. So it's really actually making um, a almost an agenda of how much time they're awake and how many hours in that week it is. Um, and if you don't have the possibility to get 30% of your week, look at immersion where you go on holidays to an English speaking country for a three week period in your summer break and things like that to get the English mm -hmm. goal up. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I think we did cover it in quite detail last time. Um, yes. So, but I think hopefully that gives them a few more tips as well. Yes. Um, another question that came in is concerning the uh, floor bed. And this is for an 11 month old who has been sleeping in a crib. And so of course, mom wants to know if it's not too late to uh, transfer um, him to a floor bed. And then, uh, you know, what would be the best advice on how to go about that? Yeah, it's never too late to move them to a floor bed. And I think sometimes the earlier the better, because if you try and move them at two years old, when they've had been restricted by a crib for so long, uh, they're going to have more difficulty than an 11 month old. Definitely the 11 month old is an explorer and they're going to be interested in getting out of the floor bed. But you're going to also learn that when they fall asleep on the floor, it's not as comfortable as when they fall asleep on the bed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I would take the mattress out of the cot and put it onto the floor. That can be the simplest way to make the transition um, and take the cot away. And the first few nights I would possibly sit by them and just remind them that it's sleeping time and that they fall asleep in the bed and they get used to this is the place where we sleep. I might not have that barrier around me, which I've been absorbing as that's my barrier. And now I can get out. You also need to childproof the room. You need to do a search, crawl around on the floor and check that everything's safe because your child is going to have full access to the room from the time they wake up. Mm -hmm. um, just for those who uh, maybe haven't joined one of our calls before, the Montessori floor bed is um, maybe new for people. And the idea is, is that cots are quite convenient for adults because they know that they place their child in the cot and they know where they are, and that they're safe and out of trouble harm's way. But actually Marie Montessori said, actually for freedom of movement, it's lovely if the baby can sleep on a, a floor bed so that when they wake up, instead of having to cry out to be taken out of the cot or crib, they can just wake up and crawl over to a low shelf and start exploring their environment and have some toys and low and books and things like that. Right. And they so, actually let you sleep in because they're busy to exploring their room and yeah. you don't have to be woken up by a crying baby. Yeah, so some people also, to make it safe, have a baby gate across the doorway so that you, the baby can't actually leave the room completely, but can, yes, yeah, see out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. And, and another question within this uh, sleeping thing, um, the mom asks, uh, says that the, the child is often spends the second part of the night in their bed and wanted to know what the Montessori uh, attitude about co-sleeping was. And so if I may, I will just say one thing is that 
sleeping arrangements are extremely personal and I don't think that there is a Montessori, you know, um, how do you say dogma about, you know, whether co-sleeping or not. That's really something that the family uh, establishes. And if it's working for you and you're okay with it, then fine. But if you're not getting the rest that you need to get, then maybe you need to change the routine. You know, children will um, adapt to whatever uh, the, the routine that you have created and established and that you're comfortable with. So if you are fine with having your, you know, young child come in in bed and, and finish the night in, in your bed, then be it. It's, you know, if, if it's something that um, is problematic to you, then I would definitely look at the routine and see how you can tweak it and it just, you know, with respect and, and such. So um, do you have any any words on, on that question of what is uh, the Montessori at, uh, attitude vis-a-vis uh, -vis co-sleeping? You know, I think you said it really well. It's what I find in my classes is there's every extreme when it comes to sleeping mm -hmm, and it's mm -hmm. definitely a personal preference so um, Montessori would like to move towards the child being independent in their sleeping so that they don't need someone to rock them to sleep that they can fall asleep by themselves um, because that helps them have a deeper sleep at, during the night but mm -hmm. we also not into crying it out and not like ever visiting our child our child's crying for a reason if they're exactly. having difficulty getting to sleep then I'd say give them the little bit of help that they might need to get them back to sleep. It might be stroking them, it might be having them hold your hand, it might be you sitting in the room until they fall asleep. But it's definitely a personal choice and how you move that way. But I definitely think what Jean-Marie says about at the point where you are being, it's affecting your sleep and your grumpy <laughs> levels, then you, you know yourself that it might be time to switch things up and adjust. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Definitely, yes. Um, uh, what else do we have here? So we have uh, a question for a mom that has a baby. Uh, so she was wondering about the importance of having a Montessori bedroom from the start because she understands that uh, it helps them form a mental map uh, of their room and such. And, and so um, when we say uh, mental map. It's also what what in Montessori we call points of reference. It's that that sense of order that young children need. And if we have set places for them of you know where they sleep, where they eat, where they uh, are changed, and so forth, it really helps them kind of predict and uh, anticipate what is what is expected of them. But uh, I guess she asked, how important is this concept? Um, yeah. Would you like to talk about yeah. that? This is one I saw come in by email, so uh, my uh -huh. husband read it before. And um, she also was saying, do I have to spend all my time in the bedroom? <laughs> um, I think it might have been taken a little bit out of context. I'm not sure where she read that. Except it is really, so basically the monster idea is that you bring the child home from, um, from their birth, wherever it may be, maybe even home birth, and from that time you can put a Moses basket, for example, on the place where they're going to end up sleeping. And exactly as Jean-Marie was saying, that builds up their points of reference. They know that this is going to be their sleeping spot. When they grow out of that Moses basket, then they're sleeping on the mattress. In this case, they're sleeping in the bedroom where the parent is, which is also fine. That's their point of reference. They sleep in the room where their parents are next to them. Um, there's also that they can have a movement area in the living room so that they can explore out there. That's also, they're going to have a point of reference. This is where I play in the living room and where exactly. this is where, like, yeah, this is where I get changed. This is where I eat. So uh, definitely I think it's a great idea to have a, a fixed places in their homes, but it doesn't mean that you have to just stay in the bedroom. There's definitely, Montessori is all about incorporating your child in your daily life, in your routines, and making a spot for them in all of their rooms so that they can be comfortable wherever they are. Even if you're working at home, and you have a study and you want your child to be with you, then having a play area in your study is also appropriate. 
Exactly. And to me, it's really about, like you say, it's really about setting up the home for the entire family. So, you know, this mom saying, if I spent my entire time in their bedroom, I'm not getting anything done. Well, that's, you know, that's the point about setting up the home is, is their awake time when you're needing to get things done in the house, have that movement area, like Simone says, in the living room where, where you are, you know, the bedroom should really be for, for sleeping and maybe a little, you know, reading area, kind of the, the quieter activities and the uh, awake time can be spent among, you know, all the other family members. So, uh, and, and again, it, you know, it means crawling around your home and seeing, you know, uh, everything from their perspective as to where they might uh, go and explore because we want it to be safe exploration. Right. Yes. Yes. So there's another question that came in um, on the the channel that uh, it's a, a, her. She says her daughter uh, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa, for your question. My daughter loves to build with wooden bricks, Duplos, Legos, etc. But she is reluctant to tidy up because she wants to show. Uh, her father, her great creations. And so that's not very helpful in when we need to clean up. Any suggestions um, for that, Simone? <laughs> I'm assuming that it's probably an older child because the product for an older child yes. becomes more important. So we were talking about the difference between the child from zero three to three to six. And I definitely say they're probably in that second stage, if not older. And um, for me, I actually think it's our home and we need to be a little bit relaxed about okay if they do want to keep it then let's have a mat or something like that which she's building on so that we can work around that for the day but then once we've showed papa then it gets packed away back into its box so i can't see a situation where there's so many toys out because there's so many sculptures it'd be like okay maybe there's one thing here that we want to show papa and here's something here that we were maybe crafting and um, that we want to show papa um, I kind of think that's okay. As long as everything's tidied away by the end of the day, that would be okay for me. But maybe I'm too relaxed. What do you think, Jean-Marie? Well, my, my suggestion, uh, because I'm kind of a, a neat freak, I will I will say I like things uh, put away. I would maybe suggest taking a photo of the, you know, I mean, now we all have phones that take pictures and maybe just taking a picture so we can show daddy when he comes home. Or maybe, you know, uh, drawing it uh, before we put it away. I mean, this is, you know, this is a child that wants to share what uh, what she has created to to an important person in her life. And, and maybe dad gets home a little too late and mom would like things to be tidied up before dad gets home. Uh, so, you know, it, it really, again, it, it's going to depend on your personal uh, routines. And, and also, I think when we parent, we need to be aware of what, triggers us and what uh, is important to us. So if having a tidy home when um, dad comes home is important, then we can find solutions to, to do that in a respectful manner and just explaining to our child that, you know, it's, it's uh, time before dinner and we like to tidy things up and make it part of a routine. So maybe taking a photo of the great creations is just part of the routine before we tidy up. So, you know, there's, there's, always, there's always solutions. <laughs> yeah, I like that too. I thought of ah, a photo, that could be quite handy. I'm glad you mentioned mm -hmm. it, great. Mm -hmm. Great. So um, I have some uh, some other question, and this is an uh, interesting one. I'm I'm not quite sure what your take on this is about having long curtains. Um, so uh, this is a baby loves playing with the curtains during the day, but ends up getting dizzy, loses his balance, falls, and hits his head. Making them shorter is not an option uh, because they have uh, glass walls, floor to ceiling. Uh, what is your take on full height mirror, uh, curtains and how to res restrict access to the full height curtains in a simple, light, organic uh, way? <laughs> yeah, I love this. Actually, one of my daughter's favorite things to do when she was a toddler was to wrap herself in the curtains too. Um, so mm -hmm. I had long curtains and that was okay because I feel like sometimes children just need to learn, oh, sometimes I get dizzy and I fall and I bump my head. So it's like baby proofing your house but say you don't like that and you're worried about the safety of your child particularly if it was in a bedroom I wouldn't have long curtains but in a living room area where they were mostly supervised maybe that's okay 
Otherwise, what I've done in my space in my classroom is actually tied a knot in the curtains, and it looks a little bit like, um, well, I can't really ex explain, but yeah, it's, it, so it's like it's being tied by something. Mm -hmm. And so it's just tied up out of the reach of the children, so they can't wrap themselves up in the, play, um, in the classroom. Um, so something like that might be useful. And then if you're then exposing a lot of glass, Children have got, have got to get used to having glass in their house. And um, yes. we had glass walls in our last classroom. And what we did was we put quite discreet um, window stickers along the window so they could see that there was something there that they can't just run in. You don't want a child to, to hurt themselves by running into a glass wall. But something at the child's height down low, they were just like a transparent um, white kind of milky color. And I just cut them into squares so that the child could see that there's glass there. So that might be something to do. Otherwise, I'd look at putting cushions along that wall as well so that if they hit against the wall, it's a cushion. Um, and the other thing is to just physically pick up a couch and move the couch along that glass wall so that it's not an area for playing at all. Um, I think they're some of the options right. I would do. Taking the curtains down, having a blind, and then doing something to protect them against the glass would be just also quite pretty and easy. Yeah. Yeah. And and very, you know, when you said not in the in the bedroom, and that is something very important, is everything that is hanging low in a bedroom. So if it's, you know, the the strings to open the curtains or the blinds and all that, everything needs to be really off the ground, especially if you have a floor bed, because those are uh, hazardous uh, to, to a young child if they're not being supervised. Um, so I hope that was helpful. I would also suggest putting one of the low uh, toy shelf in front of that window. Um, and then they're not, you know, bumping into the glass. But I think her concern was more about the restricting the the um, kind of using the the long uh, curtains. So maybe tying them up like you had is good. Um, the other question is, and this is interesting because it's true. I've seen this a lot. Is um, we're seeing a lot of these house uh, frame beds that look uh, very, uh, you know, very cute, especially for floor bed. It's kind of a um, uh, wooden uh, house frame that is, that is very light. And so this uh, mom is just asking, you know, what, uh, I wonder if the baby isn't going to, you know, hit themselves and attempt to climb on it instead of it feeling cozy. Um, any thoughts? Yeah, so I was thinking, I see them a lot on Pinterest too, and I think they're really cute, but I would use it more as a play area, um, relaxing space than actually using it in the bedroom. Um, if they were using it in the bedroom, I'd definitely make sure that the child can't reach, because it becomes a climbing frame and they're going to want to explore that, and it's going to be difficult right. to keep that safe. Um, so for me, it's more like, oh, this is a cozy spot in the living room where I could take my books and read there, or I could set up um, some activities and work. Um, but I'm not sure that I would use it in the bedroom as a relaxing space. Yeah. And if you are using it in the bedroom, like because uh, I've seen it for floor bed and everything, maybe if you're concerned about them bumping is I would put the, the you know, the bumpers that are usually around the crib, just kind of wrap it, uh, you know, around the four post uh, where it's close to, to them, you know, if, if you're afraid that they're going to bump. But children are pretty... Um, smart and they will you know if they bump in in they they will figure out like oh i'm not going there anymore you know they 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 get it so we don't need to to bubble wrap everything um either but um, we do not need to bubble wrap everything they do, <laughs> they do learn like it just as they have a, had a cot for many years and they bumped into that and realized oh that hurts so they're going to do the same if you had like a this little frame and exactly a, yeah, something that's safe. exactly exactly um and then this last question is about using the the sleeping sacks um how do you dress a baby uh for a floor bed you know in a montessori room uh and make sure that they stay warm because it's true that the sleep sacks um if they try to you know get off their bed and everything it could be a little bit hazardous so what do you suggest 
Yeah, well, actually, Montessori is all into freedom of movement. And so having sleeping bags and things like this aren't super recommended because they don't have that much movement. Um, if they wake up and they want to explore and they've got a, a sleeping bag on, it's very difficult. So there was kind of nothing wrong with just a blanket or a duvet over them before sleeping bags were invented. And my kids are 15 and 14 and they actually weren't really sold then. So I didn't have that issue to think about. I just put them to bed. Sometimes they woke up because they were cold and then they learned to pull the covers back on. Mm -hmm. um, so I would go with actually just dress them really normally, just like I would wear pajamas. I'd dress my baby the same way um, without anything on their feet to cover them so they can move during the, the night. And um, yeah, to give them freedom of movement even when they're sleeping. Part of our training is to do 250 hours of observation and 50 hours of that is with very young babies. So often they're sleeping and observing them when they were sleeping was fascinating because you think, oh, what is there to observe? You know, the baby's sleeping, but they move all the time. And uh, so I just found it really interesting that often we're wrapping them and tying them very tight and putting them in sleeping bags. And actually, yeah, I think um, if I could advise anything, I'd say none at all. Right, right. But uh, but I know that uh, I've had families, you know, often concerned that their child is going to get cold. So, you know, I just put an extra pair of socks or something, you know, just, just to make sure that, that, that if they do come uncovered. And I know that uh, at least here there's a big concern about having blankets and such um, in their beds because uh, we don't uh, want anything in their beds. So uh, I, do, I do recommend using kind of the sleep sack at the beginning just because they can still move but they're not yet crawling um, once they are older they're able to take a blanket off their face and so and and um, so you know just just to be vigilant as well but Great. yeah um, so yeah. Lisa's written back and said, yes, her child is three and a half. Yes, so yes, I saw that. That's yeah. really nice as well. Hi, Emily, and uh, I think Marina's on the call as well. So if, have you got time for a couple more questions? I know that we usually wrap up around the 45-minute mark, but if people have got time, there's still quite a lot sure, of people. Sure, sure, could... because I see Emily wants to know, what do you re recommend setting up to facilitate hand washing for a toddler? So maybe we'll end with that one. And there's, uh, there's also um, one more about um, the 11 month old having meals and how we can set the table for them. I don't know. If we've got time for both of them, we'll see if we can. What do you think? Sure. Uh, how about the, let's start with the hand washing. What do you sure. suggest for the toddler? Yeah, so toddlers uh, love water and they love bubbles. So pretty much hand washing is often very uh, fun for them. And sometimes the problem is when to let it end. But if they, if you have a step stool, then they can just wash their hands in the sink. And having a bar of soap or a pump where they um, can get the soap is really easy to set up. Um, but if you find that they just want the water to run and run, then you can also set up what we have in a lot of our Montessori classrooms and have a hand washing table. When the child can get a jug of water, fill up the jug of water and bring it to the table and pour it into a little bowl. Then they wet their hands and get the soap and rub their hands together, each finger, and make bubbles. And then they can spend a lot more time washing their hands, getting involved in their point of interest, whichever bit it is. It might be filling the water, or it might be making the bubbles. And then we can show them how to rinse the soap off and how to dry their hands on the hand towel. So it's breaking it into all the different steps and seeing what they're most interested in. Um, and building into your routine. We wash our hands after we've been to the toilet. We wash our hands as you're getting ready for your meal or if you're going to prepare in the food in the kitchen and those kind of things like that. And I, uh, I recommend also for the hand washing for uh, the young child to use uh, uh, bar soap as opposed to the soap, the liquid soap that pumps because that can be uh, part of a activity that doesn't stop and we get a lot, a lot, a lot of bubbles. So when traveling, um, you know, pick up some of the little hotel rooms, little uh, soaps, they're perfect uh, size for their hands. And uh, that uh, kind of alleviates uh, using up all of the, the liquid soap. If you do have liquid soap, I would transfer it into a much smaller bottle so that again, you're kind of limiting the access um, of, you know, what they, what they have. Um, so yeah, um, 
So what, what do you think? I think we've been on for, for more than 50 minutes. Um, should we wrap up or do you want to answer one more question about food? Or I had some about um, sharing Montessori space with siblings. What, uh, what would you like to end on, Simone? <laughs> I don't want to end. I find it also fun. <laughs> right, let, let's answer both really quickly. Um, okay. To answer Marina's question, she's wondering how to organize the process of having meals without a separate table for the baby. Um, as you can't set the table then and all the dishes end up on the floor. Yeah? And so I think in their space, they don't have room for a low table. And actually, I think sometimes for meal times, it's nice to have the children at the table eating the meal with you. Um, but if they're in a chair that has a table on it at the front, I would take off the table so they can be right up against the table as part of the family. And if everything's standing up on the floor, it's probably at that age where you just put a small amount of food in front of them, wait till that's been eaten, and then they're ready for more. Um, older children can start to serve themselves, but at 11 months, it's probably um, trial and error. If you put out three pieces and the three pieces end on the floor, that's too many. If um, you try one then it goes in usually fine so that's one way is just to put little bits of food for them to explore in front of them so that it doesn't be and um, if they drop something on the floor you can also ask them are you all done if they're just picking things up and throwing them on the floor it's usually a sign that they're all done for the meal and i often just say all done and they learn that all done really quickly so that would be good and then to do with um sharing spaces for siblings um yes. say you have an older child who's getting into more um, complex activities like we were talking about earlier and you have a baby in the family who's just content on destroying those because they're in the exploration right. stage right. it's really important to really think again right back to what you said at the beginning what are the needs of each of these children and for the older child it's really important to have a space where they can work undisturbed because they're going to be really devastated if that sculpture is knocked down by their brother or sister so I always right. say find a space, it might be at the dining table where they can work and the baby can't reach. It might be in their room where they can close the door. It might be in one of those sweet little tents that you can get these days and they can pin a little note on the door that says private or and then mummy can say, oh, it says private, even though the baby can't read, you know, they're saying, right, it right. says private, we're going to let your sister, you know, have some quiet time or your brother. And that, so it's really protecting that space. Um, in terms of the shelves and things like that, I'd have the activities for the older one up high out of reach of the baby and only things on the bottom shelves that is suitable for the baby. And talk to the older one. They're old enough to understand, oh, these things have got small parts and they're not suitable for your sibling to touch. So exactly. you know, introducing those ideas. There's some really quick, simple examples of how you can share a space with different age siblings. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, I think that wraps up our uh, show for today. But Simone, I know you have a course coming up Monday. Do you want to share a little bit about that? Yeah, definitely. I'm so excited because we're running, uh, setting up our Spaces Montessori style e-course, um, which starts on Monday. And it's a full week online workshop. So every few days you get sent a new lesson and we also have a Facebook group where people share their photos and we're even going to break down into smaller groups so that you can really support each other, give feedback and um, get inspiration from other people working through the program. We have already people signed up from Australia and Hong Kong and Singapore and there was one from Lithuania, Bosnia-Herzegovina. It's really incredible that we have so many people internationally interested in Montessori, can share our spaces and inspire other people and we can really tackle all these little questions so that not only do you get inspired by Pinterest and our blogs but we can actually walk through step by step each room exactly, and, um, exactly. and make some changes. So um, the people who've done the courses really like that it's um, broken down into chunks step by step. They can work through it also at their own pace and come back to lessons because it's available um, unlimited time after the course finishes as well. So you can always come back and as your child grows up and you need to, like we say, keep changing the space to keep up with them they can come back and review the lessons too so um right. it's 79 us dollars and um you can find all the details on my website the montessori notebook.com and i yes, know that you, maybe yeah. you can post the link um under the youtube video too um, i can do that too we will, we will be watching the replay and i'm excited because um i will also be part of the facebook group so i'll be um 
kind of seeing what what uh, what's going on and and I'll jump in and then give some suggestions if I may so yeah, that's uh, that's very very exciting uh, to be part of that so and I love wonderful. what you're doing at the moment too Jean-Marie because Jean-Marie is busy with giving lots of um, live calls at the moment with different people around the globe as well a good way to connect with people who can't meet up with you personally in San Diego right right so so um, my my biggest thing right now is I, I do uh, make available some private uh, coaching I have a 10 month program uh, going on so it's really uh, lovely because I get to work one-on-one -on -one, uh, with families and not only about you know setting up the environment but also about um, some you know tools to really uh, respect the child and and you know discipline in, in a positive way I'm a positive discipline parent educator as well and so I really work with with uh, individual families on on a wide range of things you know as I was saying earlier you know what triggers you sometimes there's there's things that are upsetting us and so we kind of you know look at that and and how we can maybe alter the routine so that we don't get at the end of the day or you know get triggered and and be the person we don't really want to be. So it's really a program to help you really be the, the parent that you want to be um, and and parent with, with joy and confidence. And, and you can, um, the best thing to do is if you are interested is to, on my website, there's a little tab, let's talk, and it's a free, uh, you know, 20 minute introduction and we can just uh, talk it over and see if, uh, if it's a good fit and if it's a program that you would be interested in. So it's yes. So cool. So everyone, yeah. mark your calendars now for the last Friday of April because we will be back here to answer all your questions. And um, and actually, if I may, Simone, um, I don't know if I if I shared this with you, but we will have a guest uh, for our April show. Uh, Junafa is a uh, Montessori guide, also from zero to six, but she just finished uh, the Rye. Um, uh, resource for infant educator uh, certification here in the U.S. and she actually lives in Algeria, in Nigeria, and will be on her way to Italy. But we will have her on the show to uh, ask questions about what is Rye and how it uh, works with Montessori and kind of what she learned from that training. So I'm really excited about having uh, Junifa on the show on uh, the last Friday of April super exciting all right everyone um i'm we're going to end the call here thanks again for joining us have a good night for those here in amsterdam and have a good afternoon great for day here. for for those in the us yes thank you bye right, Simone. Everyone. take care bye bye bye, -bye. bye, -bye.